At Super 8 Winnipeg West, we have your comfort in mind with free Wi-Fi and free daily Superstart breakfast. We also have guest laundry facilities, a state-of-the-art fitness center, and a jetted hot tub. Sleep well in a spacious guest room equipped with a plush new bedding, a 50-inch flat-screen HD TV, microwave, mini refrigerator, and Keurig coffee maker. Or book a suite with a kitchen, ideal for extended stays. Super 8 Winnipeg West, located just inside the perimeter on Portage Avenue. You're good, buddy. Okay. Welcome to Amateur Sports TV. I'm Matias Bueno. Here joined with three guests who are all involved in football in Manitoba. Here with Bill Johnson, the Executive Director of Football Manitoba, Kevin, who is the President of the Charles Wood Broncos Football Club, and Daryl, who is the Operations and Equipment Manager of the Charles Wood Broncos Football Club. Guys, thanks for being here. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Now, you guys have been involved with football in Manitoba, I as a player or as a coach, and also as a volunteer and with work as you guys have gotten older. So can you tell us a little bit each about your involvement with football in your life in here in Manitoba? Sure. I, uh, I played football as a very, very young man, and uh, then I, uh, I went away for a while. I've, I've, I've been a lifelong fan of football, but I coached basketball uh, professionally, uh, wheelchair basketball with our national team for several years. and. Uh, I got involved in football again when I had kids of my own and my son plays now and my daughter plays flag football as well. My son plays both tackle and flag and that's how I got involved again. And then uh, I've been working with Football Manitoba in the role of executive director now for just over two years. Awesome. And Kevin? Uh, I've been playing for a long time uh, and then got involved with the Charleswood Broncos uh, through my kids. Uh, two sons that played football and my daughter that played tackle football. We were the uh, one of the first teams uh, to join the uh, Manitoba Girls Football Association, and uh, we we were one of the teams that uh, initiated it. Awesome, thank you, um, or Daryl. I played high school and then uh, senior football, and stopped playing. And a friend of mine, his son, started playing, so he coerced me into coaching with them, and it's kind of that was 12 years ago. So I've been coaching ever since and just slowly got more involved with the club. And how long have you been here with the Charles and Broncos Football Club? Ten years. Oh, ten years. Nice. Yeah. So lots of experience in the community in, in Manitoba with football. And the topic today is about the safety of football. And I think one of the things that we want to be able to do here is to bring football into a positive light and be able to explain and educate about the positive impact that football has on our community and on many of the players whose lives it touches. And Bill, your experience and working with Football Manitoba, what have you kind of seen over the last few years in terms of registration numbers and if it's been affected by the stigma of football being not safe for kids to play? Well, uh, I think that's two separate questions. We've seen uh, numbers in tackle football have been trending down in the last uh, decade or so. We've been monitoring that pretty closely. And every year we're down anywhere between five and 15% on the, on the tackle numbers. Uh, I think that's uh, partially due to safety, as you mentioned. And I think it's also uh, surveying people. We've done some informal surveying of people who've walked away from the game. It's, uh, there's other factors involved as well. People who, uh, they don't enjoy the experience as much for various reasons, things like that. And those are all things that we at Football Manitoba are helping our, our leagues and member clubs to address. And regarding what you guys have, have done in terms of like looking at the registration numbers with non with non tackle football with flag, have you seen any increase in that over the years, or has that been kind of stagnant? Uh, flag has been growing consistently for the last several years, uh, especially with the younger kids who are just getting introduced to the game. We've seen the, those numbers increase for the last two years I guess the numbers have been uh, pretty uh, pretty flat at uh, we're, we're somewhere between 1300 and 1500 kids playing flag in the province now. So. And uh, Kevin and Daryl in terms of the Charleswood Broncos involvement in all the amateur leagues within Manitoba what have you guys kind of seen in terms of registration in terms of the number of teams that Charles has been able to field over the last few years? Um, it's been as it's been as I'll say steady de decline um, the area we service, we can't really get into some of the upper age leagues. We deal with the youngers, like the Crunchers, the Adam, the Pee Wee. We try and get into the Bantam, but it's we have a lot of high schools that have grade nine students, so it's hard to get those ages. But those numbers, it's it's been decreasing over years. I mean, since I started, it's when I first started, we had four Cruncher teams. Now we have one. Um, we'd have two Bantam teams. Now we have none it's 
it's just been tapering off year after year after year. Um, a lot of it is parents think football is dangerous, and it's a lot of education trying to have them understand that it's not what it's not the devil they think it is. It's not that bad. I mean, it's it's a contact sport, but you get a lot out of it. And Kevin, with your experience with the Charles of Broncos, what have you kind of seen in terms of how the club has been able to respond and how they've kind of handled any steady decline in terms of registration numbers and how they've gone forth with the teams that they fielded? Well, we have seen, I mean, it's like everybody says, we have seen a steady decline. But what we've done is through Football Manitoba, they introduced the first down program, which is kids ages four to seven. seven. Okay, I'm going to get that right. <laughs> and uh, it, it's totally non-contact. It introduces the kids to uh, football. We, we run them through drills. We get them just a lot of running around. And we make sure that the kids have a lot of fun. They also get to handle the ball. They do some kicking. They do a lot of different things. But it introduces them to football and shows them that it's not a big scary animal that everybody thinks. And it gets them prepared for the cruncher age where they actually get to strap on some equipment and... Uh, the, the feedback that we've been getting for that is the kids can't wait to get the equipment on. We've also made sure that we're training the kids properly so that we reduce the amount of injuries and that's the whole key I think is making sure the kids know how to tackle properly, how to land properly, how to hit properly and how to wear their equipment all the time properly. Uh, we, we've really enhance the safety and we want to make sure that it is a good safe uh, environment for all the kids and hopefully that uh, the numbers do increase with some of the programs and, and initiatives that we started. I think Kevin makes a, he touches on a really good point there. I think that uh, football is often seen as the uh, the poster child for especially for, for brain injuries in sport. Concussion, people talk about concussions, they talk about football. Will Smith's making movies about football players having concussions, things like that. And fair enough, there are concussions in football. It happens. We know, we know we're know. we aware that there's a risk with that. However, I would argue that football is also the single sport doing the most to to change that. To uh, There's evolution in equipment all the time. There's changes in practice habits and constantly we're evolving, limiting the number of contact or the amount of contact rather kids have in practice, limiting the amount of uh, contact number of hits kids can take in the course of a week, the number of games they can play, there's a set num amount of time between uh, games, set number of weeks they can play over the course of a year so that they make sure that their bodies have time to recover before they, they play again. And I, I, I think it's important to note that we don't, we don't have our heads buried in the sand with this whole issue. We, we're aware that this is a concern in football and we are doing everything we can to ensure that it's a safe, positive experience because as both these gentlemen have spoken of, there are a lot of positive benefits to football that I think it's important that these kids have. And how long have you guys been running that pro that first down program? How many years has it been around? And what was what was the idea behind its inception with mm -hmm. making sure that it would implement a good environment for kids to be able to be introduced to football? Uh, this is the second year we've run uh, first down here in the province. Uh, it's actually a Football Canada program that they passed down to us, and it's uh, it's a it's an excellent program. I commend them for for their development of it. And as Kevin spoke of, it's a, it's a great opportunity for kids to have a positive experience at a football club. And uh, it, it's a great introduction for kids to it. It's, uh, it's based on fundamental movement skills, which is something that uh, while they're learning um, football skills, they're also just learning movement skills. They're learning how to run, how to, how to shuffle, how to backpedal, things like that, that will benefit them in all walks of life. Any, any physical activity they choose to move on, or even just their own physical well-being will be benefited from participating in a program such as that. And I think that, uh, I mean, obviously our goal is to see some of these people, most of the participants carry on and, and stick with football. But I think even just the fact that they're having this, uh, these great skills taught to them in, in this environment, it's going to benefit people in the long run either way, whether they stick with football or not. Now, football has been around in Manitoba for a very long time, and we know that there have been a lot of clubs that have, have a great history here in the province, Charles would being one of them. And what can you guys speak to in terms of the benefits that football has had that you've seen firsthand on many of the players and kids that have come through this program and what it's taught them in terms of life skills and how it's transformed them as athletes and as people in the community? Daryl, you can... Um, we've had a lot of kids that have gone through our program come back when they're in high school or in university and just... The feedback we get from them is like this is some, one of their 
some of their best years. This is where they had a lot of fun. They were learning all the time, but it was a great environment. It was a great team. It was, you know, it was a good place to be. It was where they looked forward to going uh, to practice in the evening. It was, you know, some of their weekends in the summer were spent at games and it was just, they had a lot of fun. But it also, they learned that if they wanted to go somewhere with it, they had to fall, they had to be disciplined, they had to be focused, they had to keep in mind of what they wanted to do and where they wanted to go with it. It wasn't just, they weren't going to have it easy. Nothing is going to come easy. And one of the biggest thing they learned is discipline and teamwork. It's, they're, no, they're only one part of the wheel in the whole team. They got to all work together. They can't be the lone one out there doing everything themselves. They have to have everybody with them. I think just teamwork and discipline is probably the two best things they've ever come back with. And, and your experience, Kevin, what can you kind of speak to in terms of the personal experiences and, and what you've seen in your time here with the club and also over the course of your life with how football has positively impacted people? You know, I, I've seen a lot of kids go through and, and uh, they've had nothing good, nothing but good things to say about the uh, Charles Wood Bronco Football Club. One of the things that I emphasized when I coached was you look around, there's, there's no size, there's no color, there's no race, there's no sex, there's no nothing. You're stepping on the field, you're all football players and you all help each other. And I think that emphasizes a lot where the kids start not seeing any difference other than the fact that they're football players and these are my teammates and I help my teammates. And I think that says a lot to the, the sport itself where you get together and you meld as a team and it doesn't matter who you are, what walk of life you come from, you're a team and you help your teammate and that speaks volumes to this, the, 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 the game itself and the kids character. I, uh, I had the opportunity to, we had uh, Angus Reed came to town, former BC Lion, mm -hmm. and he spoke at a coaching conference we put on with Football Manitoba. And uh, one of the things that he said that really resonated with me in terms of experience with, uh, with football was, he said, it's the only, uh, only place that teaches you skills in terms of truly correcting problems. So there's a situation where you go and you run a play and everything goes completely sideways and it's a disaster. And you have 20 seconds to communicate and fix it before you do it again. And I think that, that it just teaches such innate skills that people don't even realize they're learning in those situations. You have to huddle up. And there's no time for this nonsense chatter about, oh, I'm sorry, it shouldn't happen. That we have to fix this. How do we fix it? And I think that uh, that's such an important skill. And I know from my own personal experience with my son, the, the greatest experience that I see that he's taken away from football is the ability to understand when he's let someone down when he's failed, when he's missed a block and some quarterback has been tackled and is looking at him and he has to look that guy in the eye and he has to say, that's my fault, I'm sorry, it won't happen again. And I think that's such an important skill that is overlooked a lot in society nowadays that football does such an excellent job in teaching young people. We'll be right back with a message from our sponsor. After commercial break, we'll be taking a closer look at some of the football equipment that has become safer over the years. If you take the first mortgage you're offered, a high interest rate could take your travel budget and send it packing. Before you choose a mortgage, take a second look. Get serious about your mortgage. Contact Case Financial Group today. If you take the biggest mortgage you can get, you might find your budget can't support other important costs, like buying furniture. Don't let your mortgage weigh you down. Get serious about your mortgage. Contact Case Financial Group today. Welcome back to Amateur Sports TV. Matias Bueno here with Bill Johnson and Kevin and Daryl, the president of the Charles of Broncos Football Club, executive director of Football Manitoba, as well as the operations and equipment manager of the Charles Wood Broncos Football Club. We return here to our com topic of conversation about safety in football and we talked a little bit about the impact and the great positive impact that football has on young kids' lives and the importance of how everyone has to play as a team and that discipline and learning how to fix your mistakes are such crucial life skills that people can gain and understand from just playing the sport of football even as at a young age. And now we're going to shift the topic of conversation over to equipment in football. And Daryl, you have some equipment there, uh, helmet and shoulder pads for youth. Well, yeah, just to show you off. Um how high equipment football helmets have changed over the years. 10, 12 years ago, this was a normal helmet. 
it's literally just a foam pad with a softer foam pad on the inside you put cheek pads in to adjust to the kid and that's what they played in then they got a little bit smarter but again your another foam pad this time with an air bladder you could actually expand to snug up on the kid's head a little bit so it didn't move as much but that was it one of the newer ones we have it's actually a zenith helmet it's got a whole bunch of little air bladders that actually will absorb the impact when a player's head hits something now when you're coaching kids to play football you never teach them to actually use their head this is just to protect them it's not actually to hit with the nice thing with this helmet is also when you put it on tighten it up it actually straps down and actually sits on their head properly a lot of players just want to be able to move their helmet around that's not actually a well-adjusted helmet so in these ones you get the air bladders taking a lot of the impact the shell on the outside taking some of the impact and the air bladder taking more of the impact it's a lot more protection for a player's head and that's you know the one thing we're always worried about is players is concussions and player safety I mean everybody asks about it it's always changing the helmets are always changing to make it better they're always adjusting how they fit the way they fit what protection they offer the kids when you get to shoulder pads you have they've adjusted changed the foam they've taken the foam and it used to be just kind of almost like a stiff styrofoam well that's not really absorbing much now they've gone into a softer thicker foam and changed the way the shoulder pads fit the way they fit on the shoulders the way they fit on the chest the way they even strap down um, some players used to always want to have their shoulder pads kind of loose so that they can move around again that's not a well fitted shoulder pad you want it snug you don't want it to be always up and down and just bobbing around it's you know they change the plastic they upgrade the plastic they upgrade the strapping they upgrade the foam there's new innovations every year in how they what they do with shoulder pads and helmets and those are the two biggest pieces of equipment that you can offer a kid in football and in terms of the lifespan of some of this equipment what is kind of the protocol or the rule of thumb that you guys have mandated to ensure that all equipment is always up to date so that kids are safe wearing any amount of equipment that you guys are going to provide to them um usually anything over five years we try and get we'll start getting rid of it um just because we end up with a little bit longer lifespan than say a professional football players or a college or high school players because our kids aren't having those huge impacts they're not getting that kind of you know wear on their helmets so usually after about five years we're starting to rotate them out bringing in new helmets it's always trying to cycle through new equipment every year so that the older stuff's going out and newer stuff is coming in and in terms of shoulder pads would it be kind of along the same lines or or is that or, do, or would shoulder pads have a bit of a longer lifespan in terms of their impact they're about seven years about seven years seven eight years and we're starting to kind of push them out the door you only have ones that some reason they didn't get handed out for a couple of years well there might be eight years but they're still in great shape because nobody wore them but you know you always get a look at it and every winter we get equipment back and take a look at it and see what kind of shape it's in we've had helmets that were three years old that we chucked out because everything was wrecked on it so not worth keeping it we can't hand that out to another kid it's just it's destroyed in terms of what you guys have done here at the Charles Wood Broncos Football Club, Kevin and Daryl, what have you guys implemented in terms of personnel and in terms of education for your coaches and parent volunteers to ensure that any concussion symptoms are closely looked at and to make sure that players are very safe and ready to go in terms of their health once they have received or if they do receive a concussion throughout the course of a season? Well, our as soon as if you suspect a player got a concussion in a game or practice or anywhere in football the first thing that happens is they're never going they're not going back on a football field until if, if, if i may for a second here football manitoba actually has established guidelines that all of our clubs follow so we we actually have protocols in place for these things so we and it's all outlined on our website people can go and access that concussion information right there and there's there's return to play forms that are required by a doctor before kids can come in and as daryl says it i mean we if anything we're we're hypersensitive we overreact to these sorts of things just because we don't ever want to put a kid in a position where we could potentially become uh, 
further injured through uh, through our actions. And and we're aware of situations that have happened. The uh, rugby player Rowan in in Ontario and situations like that. That uh, we want to make sure that we never we never have a situation like that. So we we follow the parachute protocols, which are nationally recognized protocols in terms of uh, concussion awareness and return to play. And we we follow those with football Manitoba and all of our clubs and leagues follow those same protocols. We're, we're, I mean, we're extra careful, like Daryl says, if anything we go over, uh, basically it's when in doubt, pull them out, because we don't want kids that are out there that may or may not have a concussion. It's better to get them checked out and the doc says, hey, you know what, he doesn't have one. Okay, great, let's put him in. But we don't want to take the chance that he does have one and have them go in. Uh, we have, I guess, implemented a lot of training for our coaches and our, and our trainers that watch for I'll say the big hit that does cause maybe an injury again it's when in doubt pull him out and we make sure it's the kid's safety first whether he's the star player or not it doesn't really matter he, it's a kid that's playing in the football uh, on the field if they're injured no matter what position they're in they're being pulled and the concussions are have been seen as a very big problem in the sport of football and especially like you said bill with football manitoba doing the best you can to minimize any instances and also to make sure that even if you're overreacting to ensure that no situations ever arise of players getting further further injured due to a person not being able to take the necessary steps to prevent them from being on the field if there's a suspected concussion that a player will have and regarding the safety of football for kids there was a headline that talked about Football Canada's mandate to eliminate 12 on 12 tackle football for uh, any kids who are 12 years of age and younger. And Bill, in, here in Manitoba, what is the how, what has the mandate been around the organizations for 12 on 12 tackle football for youth? And what have you guys kind of done over the years to make sure that kids are safe while they are playing tackle football? Well, our biggest minor league, which is the MMFA, um, Manitoba Minor Football Association, has never had 12-on-12 12 12 football for kids under the age of 12. It's, uh, it's always been a progression. So our crunchers, which are our youngest age, which is the U10 age division, they start at six aside. And then when they move up to Adam, which is U12, then they play nine aside and we progress from there. So it's never been, uh, while well, that mandate from Football Canada, I applaud it. And I think it's a, it's a move, it's a, it's a very positive move in terms of development and, and the progression that is needed. It's something that we, we were ahead of the curve in somewhat uh, here in Manitoba. And what can you guys kind of speak to in terms of the benefits that's had here at the Charles of Broncos Football Club with having tackled organized teams for under 12 that are less than 12 on 12 kids aside and what has that kind of helped you guys as coaches to do with improving the skills of the players on the team? Um, I'll, I'll talk to Adam because that's not actually what I'm coaching right now. Having nine aside it's more than enough for the kids to try and understand everything that's going on with nine players on their team on the field. If I tried to put 12 players on the field at that age, there's too many kids who would just, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, I don't know where I'm going, I don't know what's going on. With nine aside, you can take those nine kids and actually coach them and educate them. There's not too many kids to work around. It's more about getting that player to the next level, to the next ability and if we tried doing more players at the younger ages I think you would lose too much of that you just wouldn't have the right development for those ages so. would you would you know how many years that football Manitoba has been has has fulfilled this mandate in terms of having no 12 on 12 tackle football for kids under the age of 12 as far as I know, that's always been the case. I don't yeah, think it's a matter yeah, of... I uh, think so. don't remember yeah. ever seeing... Yeah. We've always had that, I think. It's always been here. And and it's like Daryl says, it's, a, it's kind of a natural progression where the kids can learn and develop their football skills rather than getting into a big scrum, so to speak, with 12 kids under the age of 10 and wondering <coughs> what they're doing. It's easier for the coaches to help develop their skills and it's easier for the kids to get more, I'll say one-on-one -on -one coach time learning the game rather than just going out knocking heads and not knowing what they're doing. It's actually kind of an interesting situation because I spent some time in Saskatchewan recently and Saskatchewan is, I'm 
everyone holds them on a pedestal in terms of amateur football in the country. They do a lot of things very well. They they lead in most metrics. They lead in number of participants. They lead in uh, they win every time at U18 and U16 level. They win. They're they're the most talented. But I think the most important thing is they have the most kids playing football in their province, uh, and uh, that's. I mean, it's a very positive thing. And one of the things they do very differently than most other provinces is six and nine man football. They embrace it all the way up, all the way through high school. They have many high schools playing in a six man league. 40, I think it's 42 high schools play six man football in Saskatchewan. So much, much to what Kevin's speaking of, the fact that they get that individual coaching and things like that. I just came back uh, two days ago from the U18 championship and uh, it was 12 players on their roster of 40 for Saskatchewan, all play six-man football. That's all they do, and they get the coaching they need and they make decisions because, well, as an example, when you're the only linebacker on the field, you have a lot of decisions to make out there. So you <laughs> yeah, don't to read the game true, very well. true. <laughs> Yeah, you can't rely on your, your teammates on either side of you because they're not there. So you, it's a lot of decisions and responsibilities, and I think that that's something that, uh, that we need to look at in this province as well is uh, football is football, and. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be 12 aside. There's variations of it that can be very successful as well. In my experience with football, I remember when I met some players from Saskatchewan who told me that they played on six-man teams. I was very confused initially because I was like, well, six men, like that's it? Like that, that's that's not really that much. But when you think about the opportunity gives coaches in order to improve the progressions of skill levels for these players, like you said, on a national championship winning team, Saskatchewan beating Quebec in the national championship for U18, half the team was, half the starters were playing six man football. And mm -hmm. whether provinces have six man football organized for kids who are also in the age of high school. It's, it's a very, it's a neat opportunity for smaller schools as well. So we have, uh, we have high schools in Winnipeg that just don't have enough kids to support a 12-a-side football team. Even a 9-a-side football team would be a struggle, but 6-a-side, I don't know that there's a high school that couldn't come up with, uh, with enough kids to make that work. So it's kind of a, it's a neat thing. It's something we're exploring in this province right now. How many teams in terms of high school in, in the rural communities are, are exposed to 9-man football if there is 9-man football for them? Or, or do they have to stick to 12-man? There's, uh, there's a rural league that plays in, uh, in western Manitoba and, uh, and eastern Saskatchewan actually. They have a team in Mooseman, I believe. And they're usually around 8 to 12 teams every year. It fluctuates, but they play 9-man exclusively and that's high school age. But other than that, we don't have any... We have, we have a 9-man junior varsity league that uh, just started a couple of years ago here in Manitoba. But other than that, we don't have any schools that play uh, uh, any kind of uh, variation of that. Our community teams, however, play... Uh, Quite often they'll play whatever number fits their community. So if they have less kids playing at a certain age group, they, they make it work. They find the, the number that works and they, they give those kids the opportunity to play. In terms of implementing what the minor football in Saskatchewan has been able to do with having their smaller number of teams on the field with player personnel, what steps do you think Manitoba can take going forward to implement what Saskatchewan has been doing in terms of six-man and nine-man football with high school? And how, how could you see the future unfolding in terms of Manitoba being able to have the opportunities to implement these leagues? Well, without going, without going into too many specifics, as I said, we are taking some steps to, to investigate this and see how it would fit in our model, every province being unique. Uh, we're, we're looking at that right now. but. What I would envision is one day, any kid who wants to play football, it's easy. They just come and they sign up at their club, they go to their school, whatever it is, and there's an opportunity for them to play some variation of football. Be it six man, nine man, tackle, flag, whatever it is they want to play, that opportunity exists for them. And I don't think that's the case right now, especially outside of the city of Winnipeg. I just don't think that's an opportunity for a lot of kids right now. And we all know the what a great sport football is and the skills it teaches. I want every kid to have that opportunity. In terms of what you guys have, have had for less than 12 men here at the Charles of Broncos Football Club, what can you guys speak to if there was an opportunity for more kids to be playing 6-on-6 six six or 9v9 throughout a different age groups? How do you think that would be able to affect the club in a positive way if there was more opportunities for smaller side games uh, in terms of players on the field at a time? We might have more teams. Yeah, <laughs> we'd, have, we'd have more teams. It goes back to trying to get as many kids playing as possible. Yeah. If it's a matter of we're going to play six aside at Pee Wee age, okay, we have a team, we have one team, we can do that. It's more teams, more kids, more, more ability, more exposure. And it's about making it, it's, it might be more fun for some kids to be on that size of team. 
smaller teams does give a lot of kids more opportunity and for more field time. Uh, when you have, well, let's say if you have 40 on the roster, the kids, because we have fair play, everybody plays, but you're still rotating around. When you have six, seven kids on, you're still rotating, but the kids do end up with more field time. And I think the biggest advantage is, is what we mentioned before, is, is the amount of coaching that the kids get. It's, it's when you have 40 kids on a roster, you may have a few kids that are just not there and the coach is not going to worry about them whereas you get the six the kids are all there and the coach has more time to dedicate and we don't when you have 40 kids you have to get a lot of coaches and if there isn't the time available then some kids may be lacking and we don't want that we want everybody to have the same opportunity we want everybody to have the same development we want everybody to have a great time and, and play football. It's a great game. In terms of the effects that it would have on the older age category, how have the Charles Broncos fielded teams in the midget or major category over the years, or maybe not in the experiences of yourselves? And if not, do you think that opening up the opportunity for kids in Charleswood to play 6v6 midget and major, do you think that that would be something that would, would boost the numbers in terms of older registration? I think if that opportunity were there, we'd have to really take a, we'd take a look at it. And we'd have to see if we would have kids coming out for that. Um, we haven't seen a lot of numbers for us of that age wanting to play. But, I mean, if it was all of a sudden a six versus six league, maybe we could ground up enough kids to actually have a team. It might even be worth taking a look at. Again, it's, those kids might not have played before, but it would give them an opportunity. Sometimes it's a matter of if you build it, they will come as well. If there's an opportunity yeah. there, kids will come. I think if we were afforded the opportunity and we had enough kids, we would make it happen. Without it. Say we say, we want all the kids to play. We want them to participate. We want kids to join the team and join the club and have fun. And if we had older kids that we didn't have a team for, we would find and make a team for it. Uh, we didn't have first down up until two years ago. and we got lots of kids that are interested in having a blast. So we just make it happen. And just going back to the First Down program, Bill, would you know how long First Down has been a part of Football Canada in terms of the number of years and which province it was implemented in first and and how its inception came to, to be? Well, once again, Saskatchewan has a program <laughs> called uh, Tykes on Spikes, which is very similar to First Down. And I think that's what Football Canada modeled after. The Football Canada version, which is First Down, uh, only came into being last year. We were actually one of the very first provinces to adopt Football Canada's model to uh, to run that. And I think it's uh, it's been to this point. It, I would say it's been moderately successful. We had we had about 100 kids playing uh, citywide last year. This year, I'd like to I'd like to get uh, if we could double that, that would be great. And uh, let's try and get. Uh, all these kids having positive experiences at our football clubs alongside our tackle teams. We'll be right back after this commercial with a message from our sponsor to continue our segment about safety in, in football and the importance of football as a game in our community here in Manitoba. Hi, I'm Nettie Weiss from Metal Master. You had an accident? Sometimes they're embarrassing, but they're always inconvenient. We have an incredible staff to take care of. We have platinum certified techs, in four different categories. We are certified as a gold class accredited shop. If you've made a claim already, perfect. Call us with your claim number. If you need a claim open, give us a call. We'll walk you through. Sometimes you can get a little nervous dealing with NPI. We'll help you. Metal Master Auto Body. We've got you covered. I've got the vehicle covered too. Welcome back to Amateur Sports TV. Matias Bueno here wrapping up our segment on football and safety and the positive benefits that the sport has on our community here in Manitoba. Now, gentlemen, any final words that you guys would like to have about why kids should play football and what the positive benefits are and how they outweigh any of the negatives that could come up from playing the sport? Um, I think through the teamwork and discipline and the whole team first approach, kids that didn't think they could do anything are actually able to play and be as very important part of every team it just it works it brings the best out of everybody yeah true that's uh, some kids can't find their place in life and when they're in football they do and we give them a specific position where they can excel and have a good time doing it and 
develop a, a lot of camaraderies amongst their team. I, uh, I look at society and I look at the number of former football players that we have in positions of, of leadership, uh, contributing members of society, and I think a lot of those skills that have carried them to those positions have come from the sport of football. And while we understand that there's risk and there's safety concerns in football all the time, I think that those benefits far outweigh the lessons that those people have learned to go on to become outstanding contributors to our society. I think that's critically important. And I think that uh, when you look at it in terms of risk benefit, the benefit far outweighs the risk, especially as we work to make the game safer. Great words from men who are closely involved with the football community here in Manitoba. And football, its positive benefits far outweigh the negatives that may come up. Risk does exist in football, but we all understand here through our experiences with this game that it is the ultimate team game and that football requires every single member to contribute equally in order to achieve a greater goal. That's all the time we have today here, gentlemen. So I want to thank you very much for being on the show. And we will see you guys next time for Amateur Sports TV. I'm Matias Bueno saying so long and good evening. At Super 8 Winnipeg West, we have your comfort in mind with free Wi-Fi and free daily Superstart breakfast. We also have guest laundry facilities, a state-of-the-art fitness center, and a jetted hot tub. Sleep well in a spacious guest room equipped with a plush new bedding, a 50-inch flat-screen HD TV, microwave, mini refrigerator, and Keurig coffee maker. Or book a suite with a kitchen, ideal for extended stays. Super 8 Winnipeg West, located just inside the perimeter on Portage Avenue.